Okay, good morning everyone. Just a word about uh, the next week or so of class. So today we're going to go through some background on volcanoes. My goal for the first part of class today is to give you a basic understanding of how volcanoes work, some of the processes involved in creating volcanic eruptions, and then we'll move into how these eruptions affect people. Remember last class we talked about a lot of volcanoes are found on coastlines and where do people live? Along coastlines. So worldwide, I think it's estimated there's about half a billion people that live in direct fire shot of a volcano. That's a pretty large number and there's several billion more that could easily be affected by a large eruption. So we'll get into that. Um, I really want to show a video in here on a volcanic eruption that happened in the Philippines uh, in 1991. You might think, why the Philippines? Well, once you see the video, you'll realize why here in the United States we might be concerned with that particular eruption. I'm going to show that next Tuesday, so you don't have to come to class. In fact, don't come to class because I'm not going to be here. It's something I can assign with these COVID numbers going up right now. The less time we spend here is probably better. So I'm not going to bring you here to watch a video when you can watch it at home. So I'll send you the link to that uh, over the weekend. And you can watch that. Then we'll have class again next Thursday. And <laughs> I don't know if it'll be face-to-face. -face. A lot of universities are now canceling their face-to-face -face options. And I don't know where UNC is going to fall along those lines. But if these numbers keep getting worse, then it's very possible they might send us all online for the rest of the semester. But if not, we'll meet back here next Thursday, video next Tuesday. Any questions on that? Yeah. For the video, um, are you going to um, like, sign up I'll probably give you one of those activity, like three or four questions, just sort of spread out. They'll be super easy if you watch the video. They're really easy to answer. So, yeah, I think we need to do another activity or two. I need to check with Dr. Larrick to make sure the points are all adding up properly. And, but my guess is yes. I don't know for sure, but again, I'll send that out over the weekend. Any other questions? Okay, so I think we ended here last class. We were just beginning to talk about how volcanoes work, some of the background. Um, to understand how volcanoes work, we need to talk about magma because that's what erupts out of volcanoes. And a lot of people think that magma is just melted rock, but it's actually a bit more and it's those details that are important to understand in order to figure out how volcanoes actually work and why they do the things they do. So magma has four parts or four components. It does have some melted rock. In particular, it's mostly a type of rock called silicate rock, which is something we're gonna get into here right away. And then it has some solid minerals that have melting points that are higher than the magma temperature. It has some gas and it has some xenoliths, which we talked a little about last class and we'll get to here in a second. So I have a picture here, some idiot trying to sit on a lava flow. And let me get the lights because you can't really see things very well. Hang on a sec. So this is a picture from Hawaii a couple years ago. You can see the red runny stuff. If you've seen videos about volcanoes, you've definitely seen the red runny lava flows. So that red hot material, and it is really hot. I'm smiling, but it's burning my ass. Um, but if you're able to look at this red stuff really closely right here, you can see that it's molted material. It's flowing as a liquid. But a closer look would show little tiny green minerals in there. That's the olivine I spoke of last class. Its melting point is much higher than the magma temperature. This magma temperature right here is about 1150 degrees centigrade. It's about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. I always tell people if you wanna know how hot it is, take your oven, turn it up as high as it'll go. It's like 500 degrees and then jam your head in it. And this is about four times hotter than that. So it's really hot stuff. 
But even being that hot, some minerals won't melt. So there will be some solid minerals that will be carried along in this. There's also gas. When magma is deep in the earth, it tends to be about 5% gas. By the time it gets to the earth's surface, it loses a lot of that gas and typically comes out on the earth's surface with much less gas, usually less than a percent or so. But even so, if you watch this material flow across the surface, you'll see little gas bubbles come up and pop and you can smell some of the sulfur gases. But most of the gas is actually water vapor. And then finally, there's some xenoliths, which are those little rock chunks that get picked up by the moving magma as it moves from its origin in the upper mantle up to the Earth's surface. So again, four components, melted rock, and in specific, melted silicate rock, solid minerals, gases, and xenoliths. So we'll talk about each of those in a little more detail first, and then move on to some other aspects of volcanoes in a minute. This first part's probably the most important concept in understanding how a volcano works. And it's this melted silicate material that makes up most of the material that's erupted from a volcano. Silicate minerals are the most common minerals on the Earth's surface and in the mantle as well, which makes them the most common minerals in the Earth itself. You've probably heard that life forms are carbon-based, right? Everybody, oh, we have carbon-based life in the universe. What that basically means is that most of our cells are made up of carbon-based molecules. Earth is a silicate-based body. Just like in your body, carbon is at the center of all of the cells. In the Earth, silicate is at the center of most of the rocks. And the reason it's the most common rock type and mineral type on the surface of the Earth is because it's made of the two most common elements in the Earth. Now, usually I ask people, what do you think is the most common element in the earth? And I get all sorts of answers. I get calcium and iron and magnesium. People rarely say oxygen. But as it turns out, if you pick up a normal rock, if you just go outside, pick up a rock, it's a good chance that that rock is going to be silicate based because it's the most common rock type by far. And the most common element in that rock is actually oxygen. About half of the rock is oxygen. I don't think a lot of people pick up rocks and think, this thing's made of oxygen. When I ask you, where would you find oxygen? Everybody would say, oh, it's in the air. Or you could also say it's also in water, H2O. Not many people think it's in rock. As it turns out, oxygen by percentage is actually more prevalent in rock than it is in our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is only 20 or so percent oxygen. Rocks have upwards of 50 percent. Yeah, question. Why is there more oxygen in the rocks than the atmosphere? Great question. It's a complicated question to answer, but I'll just, when our early solar system formed, when we, the sun and Mercury, and Venus, and Earth, and Mars, and Jupiter, and so on, when all those planets formed, each planet was a little farther away from the sun that was forming in the middle. And as you move away from the sun, when it formed as a star back four and a half billion years ago or so, the temperatures dropped as you moved outward from that sun. Everybody knows the sun's really hot, and as you move outward, it gets cooler and cooler. We happened to be at a distance from the sun when the Earth was formed where oxygen was really stable. So the Earth got lots of oxygen. Other planets didn't get quite as much. So if you look at all of our planets in the solar system, they each have a slightly different chemistry. 
but most of the inner planets got a lot of oxygen and a lot of the outer planets got things like helium, hydrogen. So each planet is slightly different in terms of its chemistry. And most of that ended up in the rock. Our air actually originated from volcanic eruptions way back in early Earth history. And when those volcanoes erupted, they spit out some of the oxygen that was in the Earth. So there's still lots of oxygen in the Earth itself. The second most abundant element is silicon. Oxygen and silicon, if you look at the percentage, makes up about 75% of the rock that you find in the Earth's crust. And as it turns out, those two elements, silicon and oxygen, really like each other a lot. They bond together to form a little molecule we're gonna talk about that forms the basis for most of the rocks that we have here in the Earth's surface. So what we're really going to concentrate on are these first two, silicon and oxygen. They're the most abundant, and they form together because they like each other chemically to create a really neat little molecule we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, another question. Where's what? Nitrogen, nitrogen originates uh, within the Earth itself and is liberated up to the surface. Why the atmosphere ended up with so much nitrogen in the early part of its history, I'm not totally familiar with, but it's just one of the elements that the Earth was given back when it formed as a planet. Okay, so again, silicate minerals are very common, the most common, in the Earth's surface, in the Earth itself. They're made from the two most common elements in the Earth's crust, silicon and oxygen. Those two elements like each other a lot, so they bond together to form the basic molecule for all the rocks that we will see. And that little molecule is something called the silica tetrahedron. And this is actually something I do want you to know. It's not too difficult. In fact, it's a really simple little molecule. It has one silicon in the middle, and it's surrounded by four oxygen. So when you look at lava, when you look at rocks, that's what's in most of it right there, that little simple molecule. I don't know what happened to your Green down there. No idea. Let me try. I don't know if a bulb, but you might want to move since the bulb seems to have burned out. Okay. Sorry about that. Let's get back to this. So this is simple. So there's a silicon right there in the middle and then four oxygens that surround it. And we'll talk a little more detail about this molecule in order to understand how it actually behaves. Those little tetrahedron, they like to do something that chemists call polymerize, which is bond together with one another. And when they do so, they can make all sorts of really interesting geometric arrangements. They can form themselves into sheets. Have you guys ever seen the micas? The micas are a mineral that breaks into nice flat sheets. Those sheets are made primarily of the silica tetrahedron that you see here. One thing you should know is that the bonds that hold these tetrahedron together are super, super strong. So in order to break those bonds, you need a lot of heat. You need lots of vibration to break those strong bonds. That's one of the reasons why lavas and magmas are so hot. It requires that much heat to break the bonds that hold these minerals and rocks together. So each of these little triangles represents a silica tetrahedron. In that tetrahedron, you have a silicon in the middle, four oxygen surrounding it, 
and the bonds between those tetrahedron are really strong. They can make various geometric arrangements from sheets to chains to single chains to big elaborate three-dimensional networks that I don't have a good drawing for. Now when we create magma we want to melt this stuff. So in order to break these bonds we need very very high levels of heat in order to start to break this material apart. Most of the common minerals that we have in the Earth's surface are formed by these silica tetrahedron molecules. Feldspar is the most common mineral in the Earth's crust. It's a silicate. Olivine, which is on the far right, that's the most common mineral in the Earth's mantle, and that's made of silicate. Another real common silicate mineral is quartz. Quartz is actually all tetrahedron. That's all it is. It's silicon and oxygen, and all those tetrahedron are bonded together, and that's all you have. In the case of a feldspar, or in case of a uh, olivine, you might have a few other atoms mixed in there. But quartz is all silica, all silica tetrahedron, nothing else. So these are really common minerals. They're common because they're made up of the two most common elements in the Earth's crust. The bonds are really strong. They require a lot of energy, a lot of heat to break. That's why magmas are so hot. You have to get them that hot in order to start breaking the bonds. Now this next part is something that's pretty important for how volcanoes behave. So you have these minerals that consist of different arrangements of the silica tetrahedron. To melt them, you have to heat them up high enough to start breaking bonds. But, and this is kind of important, you don't have to break every single bond in the mineral in order to get it to melt. So I'm going to show you a little diagram here in a second. Let you finish up your notes. Okay, so let's take one of these minerals that we talked about. Over here on the left, we have the silica tetrahedron arranged in a chain, okay? It's a mineral, it's a solid. They're all bonded together. In order to create magma, we want to melt this, okay? So in order to melt it, we have to heat it up. So we heat it, we heat it, we heat it to 500 degrees C, but that's not hot enough to break the bonds. We just have a hot solid. We heat it up some more, maybe 700 degrees C. Still not enough to break bonds. We have a hotter solid. Eventually though, if we add enough heat, it'll get hot enough so that we'll start breaking some bonds but we're not gonna have to break every bond in order to turn it into a liquid. So in this diagram here, you can see we have enough heat to break one of the bonds. If we heat it up a little more, maybe we break another bond. Heat it up a little more, maybe we break up another bond. What that means is that the hotter it gets, the more broken apart these minerals get, right? What should that do to the consistency of the lava or magma as it gets hotter? Do you think it'll flow easier when it's hotter or less easy when it's hotter? You're breaking more bonds, right? That's actually gonna allow it to flow more easily. That property that describes 
how easily a fluid flows is something called its viscosity. It's a term I'm sure you guys have heard of before. Viscosity is the resistance to flow. So in this case, the hotter something is, the more bonds that get broken and the more fluid it becomes. You can think of fluidity and viscosity as being sort of opposite. If something is highly fluid, flows really easy, highly fluid means low viscosity. If something doesn't flow very easily, if it has a low fluidity, that's something we call a high viscosity. So viscosity and fluidity, you can think of them as being opposites. So in this case, we lower the viscosity or we raise the fluidity by heating it up more and more, breaking more bonds, and letting it flow easier. Question, yes? So, so what could you compare the um, strength of the molecular bonds to? What could you compare the strength of the bonds to? I'm not really sure how to answer that. Just take ice, for instance, okay? Ice is solid water, right? At what temperature does ice melt? 32 Fahrenheit or zero, right? So those are much weaker bonds. In order to break the solid bonds in a silicate, you have to raise the temperature to 1,000 degrees. So they're much, much stronger. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, could you compare it to like, how much someone Could you compare it to how much? If you can, I don't know it. <laughs> so sorry about that one. I don't know the answer to that. OK, any other questions I can't answer? All right. So. The hotter the magma, the more broken down these silicates become, they become partial chains and partial sheets and partial frameworks. And the hotter they go, the more bonds break, the easier it is for that fluid to move around. Now, what I want you to do, think about a gas bubble that's in a magma, okay? You have a gas bubble in there. We talked about how magmas have a few percent gas, correct? And sometimes that gas is in the form of bubbles. What does that bubble want to do if it's in magma? Wants to rise up, right? Because it's less dense than its surroundings. That's what it wants to do. Will the viscosity of the magma affect how fast that bubble can rise? What if the magma is super pasty and viscous? will that gas bubble be able to rise? The answer is not very easily, right? You can do calculations in some forms of magma, gas bubble might rise a centimeter in a year. And other times they can rise fairly quickly. You guys have seen bubbles in clear soda, right? They can rise from the bottom of your glass to the top pretty rapidly. The more fluid your magma is, the easier it is for those gases to rise and escape. And that's going to become important when we talk about whether a volcano erupts with lava or whether it explodes. So we'll come back to that in a minute. So first component of magma is melted silicates. Silicates consist of silica tetrahedron which have a silicon atom in the middle and four oxygen surrounding it. Those tetrahedron can form together into chains and sheets, and networks. When you melt it, you start breaking some of those really strong bonds that hold those tetrahedron together. The more bonds you break, the more fluid your magma is, the lower its viscosity, and the easier it's going to be for things like gas bubbles to move around in it. The second component in magma is solid minerals. 
Again, these are minerals where the melting points are higher than the magma temperature. For example, if you go to Hawaii when it's erupting, the red runny lava that comes out on the surface of the Hawaiian volcanoes erupts with a temperature of about 1150 degrees centigrade. That's just wickedly hot. But as it turns out, it's not hot enough to melt a mineral like olivine that has a melting point that's 50 degrees hotter than that. So that olivine will be a solid in a liquid of minerals that have lower melting points. So we have liquids where the temperature is hotter than the melting point. We have solids where the liquid is lower than the melting point. If you compare this to quartz, let's say you've tossed a piece of quartz into this magma, its melting point is 700 degrees. Well, that's 450 degrees less than the magma temperature, so that material is going to melt very easily. Something like olivine will not. So quartz will be a liquid, olivine will be a solid. Point being, you have solids and you have liquids in magmas. And finally, this is the stuff that makes it all go right here, gas. Down deep in the earth, magmas have about 5% gas. The most common gas within that 5% is water. About 90% of all the gas that comes out of volcanoes is just water vapor. There's a couple of percent sulfur gases, a couple percent carbon gases, things like hydrofluoric acid. Some gases are really nasty. Some gases can kill you, but most of the gas is actually water vapor. These materials exist because their boiling points are less than the magma temperature. Water has a boiling point of 100 degrees. If you have a magma temperature of 1,000 degrees, that's way more than enough heat to turn water into steam, a gas. So we have solids, liquids, gases. And remember, when you have gases and they're in gas bubbles, they're going to want to rise up and bubble out of this stuff because they're less dense than their surroundings. And then finally, we talked a little about xenoliths last class. These are solid rock fragments picked up by the magma as it rises up to the surface from its origin in the mantle. So it can pick up pieces of the mantle and bring it up to the surface. And it can pick up rocks from the lower part of the crust. It can pick up rocks from any part of its travels from deep down until it gets erupted. And if you look at lots of lava flows that have cooled and come to rest, you will see really odd pieces of rock that seem to just be stuck in there. Those are called xenoliths. Xeno meaning foreign, lith meaning rock. I like to think of them as just hitchhikers. They're just rocks that were plucked off by the moving magma and they get carried around. So they give us an idea of what types of rocks lie beneath the volcano, which can be important information for geologists trying to figure out how volcanoes are actually working. Okay, so those are the four things that you'll find in magma. Most of it's melted rock, few percent solid minerals, few percent gas, few percent xenoliths. But most of it is the melted silicate mineral. These things tend to be really viscous. They typically don't flow very fast. Some lava flows will flow about a foot a day. The stuff in Hawaii will flow at a walking speed. The fastest lava I know of actually moved about 60 miles an hour down into a town in Africa. Happened twice where there was a tall volcano, there was a lava lake up on the top. For some reason the side of the volcano split open and all the lava in the lake poured out 
and rushed into a town called Goma. And it was estimated that because the volcano was so steep, the lava traveled up to 60 miles an hour. Actually killed about 2,000 people in the middle of the night. But that's really unusual. Most lavas, the fastest they will go is a walking speed. And sometimes much slower than that. So this is really viscous, thick, pasty material. I have some video, I don't have it with me today, but I'm one of those deviants when I see a lava flow, I like to play with it. And one thing I love to do is toss rocks at moving lava. So let's say I had a rock, 50 pound rock, okay? Imagine me picking up a 50 pound rock. Imagine there's lava flowing in front of me. If I take that 50 pound rock and throw it at the lava as hard as I can, what happens? What happens when the rock hits the lava? Yeah, it's some people think, oh, maybe you're going to splash the lava all over your part, all over yourself, right? But in order for the rock to go into the lava, the lava has to move out of its way, right? And if the lava is too thick, it can't move out of the way fast enough. Typically what happens when you chuck a rock at a lava flow is it just bounces. You got this moving stuff, you throw a rock and it'll just bounce on the surface because it's just too viscous to flow out of the way quick enough for even a 50 pound rock to go into it. That's how thick and pasty this material is. So yeah, it just sort of sits on the surface. It can even bounce. Okay. We'll come back to those properties of magma here in a little bit. We'll look at volcanoes from a bigger picture for a little bit here. So this is a course on earth hazards. Volcanoes are hazardous. That's one of the reasons we study them is because they are hazardous. Half a billion people, it's estimated, live within direct range of a volcanic, a potential volcanic eruption. I mentioned last class, I know a volcano in Indonesia that's been erupting for several decades. A million people live on the flanks of that volcano. It's one of the most densely populated places in the world. It's in Indonesia on the island of Java just east of Jakarta, the capital city. But because the volcano's erupting all the time, producing lots of ash, there's really great soil, it's a great place to farm. People can make a good living farming there. So they put up with the risk of a continually erupting volcano because they're able to live a good lifestyle with the money they make from farming. On occasion though, the volcano kills people. So it's a hazard they live with daily. There's a town in Japan, Kagoshima, has over a million people in it. And just on the edge of town is a volcano that erupts constantly every day, Sakurajima volcano has small explosions all the time. Kids in Kagoshima walk to school with hard hats on because occasionally big rocks will fly into town. That's just what they deal with. That's part of living there. So we have half a billion people that live right next to volcanoes and probably a couple billion more that could be affected by a really large eruption. And in fact, during the Last century, we had about 70,000 deaths worldwide. Sadly, 29,000 of them were at one volcano that we'll talk about here in a minute. There was another volcanic eruption that killed 25,000. So two volcanic eruptions accounted for over half of those deaths. And volcanoes are associated with other hazards as well. 
Some large earthquakes can originate during large volcanic eruptions. Some volcanic eruptions happen in the ocean and by displacing land during the eruption they can create tsunamis. Back in 1883 there was a volcanic island in Indonesia called Krakatoa that you might have heard about. It erupted so large that it collapsed into the ocean. The whole island just collapsed suddenly into the ocean because so much material had been erupted from below, just fell in on itself. And when that happened, it sent a tidal wave that went around the world twice. Killed 36,000 people in Thailand. So these things can be really deadly. And volcanoes have an effect on climate too. Typically what they do if the volcanic eruption is big enough is they'll put enough ash into the atmosphere to block out the sun to some degree for a couple of years and lower global temperatures. We'll talk a little about that a little later. So these things can affect people that are very close to the volcano and sometimes they affect populations worldwide. So that's something as humans that could be a negative impact on us. But volcanoes can have a positive impact on us as well. They're a potential heat and energy source. Iceland, New Zealand, both of these countries get a large percentage of their energy from geothermal energy sources, from the volcanoes, from the heat from volcanoes. They use it to heat up water. That expanding steam can turn turbines and create electricity. So we can use volcanoes for our own benefit if they don't kill us first. Volcanoes are melted rock. After they're done erupting and cool off, that liquid rock becomes solid rock. Solid rock is made of minerals and some of those minerals are of value to us as humans. We find most of the world's gold and copper deposits near old volcanoes. So volcanoes create minerals that we can use to make products that make our life a little easier. There have been numerous times in the four and a half billion year history of the earth where large percentages of existing life forms have been wiped out. Most people think about the demise of the dinosaurs, right? 65 million years ago. Dinosaurs were the dominant life forms for a couple hundred million years and they seem to be wiped out in one event. We think now that event was that the earth got hit by a big meteor asteroid. It impacted the earth, threw material up into the air, blocked out the sun, affected climate, wiped out the food source, and the reptiles died away while mammals were able to survive. But that's not the only mass extinction in earth history. There's been a bunch. The biggest one happened way before the demise of the dinosaurs. There was one mass extinction event that wiped out 90% of life forms on the planet. And that particular mass extinction probably wasn't caused by a meteor. It's probably caused by a huge volcanic eruption up in Siberia. So much material came onto the ground, so much gas went into the atmosphere that it altered our atmosphere to the point where just about everything on Earth died. So understanding volcanoes gives us an avenue for understanding some of these mass extinction events that have happened in the past and could happen again in the future as well. One of the big topics we have today in science and in politics is the changing climate. The climate is absolutely 100% changing. Somebody says, I don't believe in climate change. They're just wrong. The climate has always changed. Just 10,000 years ago, we were in an ice age. 
And it wasn't just one ice age. The Earth has experienced at least six major ice ages. And then between the ice ages, the Earth warms up. If you go back to when the dinosaurs lived on Earth, it was estimated that temperatures were 20 to 30 degrees warmer than they are now. That's great if you're a reptile. Remember, reptiles are cold-blooded. They like warm temperatures. Sucks if you're a mammal. So we know the climate has always changed. Now, over the last 100 years or so, we're really worried about the climate changing because of human activities basically burning carbon fuels that have been stuck in the ground for millions of years. And in order to really understand how much effect humans are having on climate change, we have to understand all of the natural influences on climate change. We're worried about our burning of carbon-based fossil fuels. Volcanoes, however, spit up an awful lot of gas, and some of that gas is carbon-based. We need to know how much gas is coming out of volcanoes, whether that's changed over time, how much gas is being produced through human activities, how much that's changed over time. We need to understand all this in order to have a better grip on what's happening with our changing climate. And then at that point, we can decide what should we do about it. At this point in time, it's pretty obvious we're doing things that are affecting the climate. Volcanoes have been erupting forever. There seems to be no increase in the amount of volcanic activity over time, but yet carbon gases are rising, and the best culprit for that is human beings. Boy, nothing wants to work here today. All right, sorry about that. room has a mind of its own. We have other planets in our solar system. Mercury, Mars, Venus, here in the inner solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, if you want to count Pluto as a planet still, I do. One thing that all these planets seem to have in common is there's lots of volcanic activity. To understand these other planets and to understand how Earth behaves similarly and differently to these other planets, we need to know something about how volcanoes work because it's a major process that occurs on other planets. A lot of my research is funded by NASA and I get asked all the time, why should we be spending money studying Mars and Venus when there's so much to learn about here on Earth? It's a legitimate question, right? Why should we take our money and study places that we might never get to? I'll answer it like this. I'm a human being, right? If you wanted to know about human beings, you could study me, right? You could watch me all day, watch my behaviors. You could dissect me hopefully once I'm dead, and look at what's going on inside of me. You could learn a lot by looking at me, right? Could you learn everything there is to know about human beings by looking at me? Absolutely not, right? You're all different than I am. There's a lot to be learned by looking at how I compare to other humans. I would argue it's the same thing with the Earth and the other planets. We can learn a lot about the Earth by looking at the Earth. But we can learn a lot more about our planet by comparing it to other nearby planets that have similarities and differences. I won't get into it in here, but if you look at the planet Mars, it has bigger volcanoes than here on Earth. I'll probably show some today. The biggest volcano in the solar system is on this little tiny planet Mars. One volcano there is bigger than the state of Colorado and it's 90,000 feet high. The tallest thing here on Earth is Mount Everest, 30,000 feet. Here we're a much bigger planet, and yet tiny Mars has volcanoes that dwarf ours. And it's like, well, then you start asking questions like, how is Mars different than the Earth? And one of the things we think is that Mars doesn't have plate tectonics. 
Then you ask more questions. Well, why does Earth have plate tectonics and not Mars? And it allows us to ask questions that we normally wouldn't ask and learn more about our Earth in the process. So studying volcanoes on other planets can tell us a lot about how our volcanoes here on Earth behave. Now my mom, my mom died a couple years ago. When she was alive, she always asked, she was always worried about me. She goes, why do you study volcanoes? Why do you study volcanoes? And I would always tell her it's because, you know, so many people are affected by volcanoes. And, you know, I really want to do work that would help them. But I have to admit that was a lie. I do want to help people. That's really great. But the real reason I study volcanoes, I have to admit, is really shallow. I study volcanoes really for one reason. It's because they're really awesome. I love them, especially as a kid growing up in Wisconsin. They're just so different than the landscapes that I grew up with. So I've always been really fascinated with them. Sure, I'd love to save people's lives, but even if it didn't, I would still study these things because they are just immensely fascinating. Okay, a few more tidbits of background before we talk about the death and destruction and hazards. So magma is produced generally in the upper mantle and the lower parts of the crust, and then it rises up towards the Earth's surface because it's less dense than its surroundings. And typically what happens is that it rises, at some point it comes in contact with rocks that are the same density. As you get closer to the Earth's surface, the density of the rocks is less and less. They're under less pressure. At some point that magma is gonna come in contact with rocks that are of similar density and it stops. And it starts to accumulate. And it'll accumulate in bodies that we call magma chambers. It's just subsurface holding areas they can be really big. If you go to Yellowstone, the magma chamber there is about 60 miles across and 30 miles wide and several miles deep. It's huge. It would extend from here all the way to DIA, several miles beneath the surface. Just a ridiculous amount of magma being held down there. And yet in other places, places like Hawaii, there might not be any single defined opening or chamber that exists down there. Instead, the magma just exists in a series of interconnecting cracks that might be a few inches wide to a few feet wide. So it depends on where you are, what magma type, but in general this term magma chamber is just a subsurface holding area for magma prior to eruption on the surface. All right, it's kind of a busy diagram. I'll go through it slow. I grew up in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, for everything I know, has never had a volcanic eruption. Go back as far as it's been part of the Earth's surface, I don't think there's a volcanic rock there, unless it was scraped down by glaciers during the last ice age. Iowa. I don't think Iowa has ever had a volcanic eruption. Florida. Some places on Earth have volcanic eruptions and others don't. So what that means most likely is that some parts of the Earth are prone to heating up enough to create magma and others aren't. So why do some areas have volcanic eruptions and others don't? We know volcanoes tend to form along plate margins, but why? What is it about plate margins that creates enough energy for melting that doesn't exist within most plates themselves? Well, this diagram has five different things listed. The first two exist everywhere on Earth. Everywhere you go, Iowa, India, Central Asia, Antarctica, coastlines, not coastlines, 
everywhere on the planet, you have these first two heat sources. The first one's called the geothermal gradient. This is just the natural heating of the Earth as you go down into the Earth. As you go down the Earth, it gets hotter and hotter. By the time you get to the inner core, the solid metal inner core, it's as hot as the surface of the sun. I mentioned during our plate tectonic chapter that I went down into a mine in South Dakota, mine that was over 10,000 feet deep, almost two miles, went down by elevator. They have a big elevator that takes workers to the bottom of the mine. It takes 20 minutes elevator ride to get down there. And when I got to the bottom, it was 122 or 23 degrees. Just unbearable. The air didn't move. It was humid. <clears throat> Diesel fumes from the machinery they had down there. Just horrible working conditions. In fact, it was so horrible that you really couldn't go down farther and hotter because it was just too miserable for the people to work. Now you could say, why not air condition it? Well, that costs money, so much money that it doesn't make it worth extracting the gold that's down there. So as you go farther in the earth, it gets hotter and hotter. <clears throat> that alone would suggest that at some point it should melt, but that doesn't happen. What's also happening as you're going farther in the earth is that the pressure is increasing. And that pressure is preventing or retarding melting from occurring. It's squishing together all those atoms. They're heating up, they're vibrating, they want to melt, but the enormous pressure is keeping them packed close together. So most places, the geothermal gradient gets rocks close to melting, but doesn't get it there all by itself. We also know there's lots of radioactive elements in the Earth. They're kind of distributed all over the planet. As they decay, they give off heat. But, just like the geothermal gradient, they exist everywhere. And melting does not exist everywhere. So you can think of this chart as being one where the first two get rocks everywhere on Earth close to melting deep down, but not enough. So you need an additional heat source or some sort of change to induce melting. And the changes that I have listed here don't happen everywhere. We talked about how many volcanoes exist along coastlines at subduction zones. So what is it about subduction zones that take rock that isn't ready to melt. It's hot, it's close to melting because of the geothermal gradient radioactivity, but something at subduction zones is going on that actually makes it melt. And what it is, we think, remember a subduction zone is where an ocean plate slips beneath a continental plate? Well, that ocean plate has been sitting on the ocean floor for millions of years. The ocean water has interacted with the rocks in the ocean floor, and those rocks have incorporated some of that water into them. There's lots of clay minerals that have water. And then when that material is subducted down into the mantle, it releases the water into the mantle, and what it does is it lowers the melting point of the rocks. You're not increasing the heat, what you're doing is you're making the rock weaker and more susceptible to melting. So where we have subduction zones, water released from rocks that were once on the ocean floor lowers the melting point of the mantle and allows melting to occur. So you're actually not adding any more heat. You're just changing the melting point so that it's lower, so that the heat that exists there already is able to melt it. So that kind of explains why at subduction zones, edges of continents, we get some volcanic activity. But we also know there's lots of volcanic activity out in the oceans themselves where we have two plates that are 
moving apart from one another, divergent boundaries. We don't think in these areas that the melting is from water getting in. We think instead it might be through a process called decompression. When the plates get pulled apart, it lowers the pressure on the material below and lowering the pressure can induce melting. You got those atoms, they're vibrating because it's hot, but they can't quite break their bonds. If you release the pressure, they're able to expand out more. And those vibrations can then start breaking bonds and causing melting. Okay, so geothermal gradient radioactivity gets rocks everywhere on Earth hot, but not hot enough to melt. At subduction zones, we have water getting in that's lowering the melting point of the mantle, allowing melting to occur. At divergent boundaries, we have plates be, being pulled apart, which lowers the pressure, which allows melting. That explains more than 90% of the volcanoes on Earth. But there's a couple volcanoes that don't occur on plate boundaries and don't occur at divergent plate boundaries in the ocean. They're in the middle of the continents. Hawaii is in the middle of Pacific plate. Yellowstone is in the middle of North American plate. Nowhere near a subduction zone, nowhere near a divergent boundary. So we have to have a different mechanism for how the volcanoes there formed. And these are the ones that still kind of confound us as scientists. What we think is happening is that for some reason, reason we don't understand yet, the mantle is unusually close to the surface, giving off enough heat to create melting. So we call this intraplate volcanism, or volcanoes that happen within a plate rather than on the edges of the plate. So geothermal gradient, radioactivity gets rocks hot. At subduction zone, water getting into the upper mantle lowers the melting point. At divergent boundaries, the plates getting pulled apart lowers the pressure. Both of those situations cause melting. And then for those few odd volcanoes that are in the middle of plates, we think the mantle is unusually close to the surface. So that is the origin of our volcanic activity here on Earth. You guys have any questions? Okay. This is an explanation diagram of what's going on in Hawaii. Remember Hawaii? The volcanoes are not on the edge of the plate, they're in the middle. So what we think is happening, if you look at the big part of the diagram here, is that we have what's called a mantle plume or a hot spot that's burning a volcano into the ocean crust. So today, if you go to Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii, that's the only island where we've had a lot of volcanic activity in recent times. But you know there's other Hawaiian islands, right? So big island of Hawaii has activity today. There's nothing erupting today, but we had an eruption just two years ago. It's pretty much in a state where it erupts most of the time. But the closest island to the big island is Maui. If you look at the rocks in Maui, they're all about a million years old. So that's where the hotspot was a million years ago. If you go to Molokai, about a million and a half years ago. Oahu, two to three million years ago. Finally, Kauai, around five million years ago. You can see as you get farther away from the present day activity, the rocks get older, right? So the idea is, is that what's happening is the hot spot staying stationary and the Pacific plate is moving across. And in fact, if you look at the globe view here, you can see a whole chain of islands starting at modern day Hawaii, extending all the way out to here, and then all the way up to Kamchatka. If you go up to this end of the chain, the rocks are about 65 million years ago. So when the dinosaurs last died out, this part of the crust was where Hawaii was today. 
And since that time it's moved, it's changed directions. What's gonna happen as time goes on? This plate is gonna keep moving to the west and we should get another island that forms off the east coast of Hawaii. And in fact, there is. There is a submarine seamount right off the east coast of Hawaii. It hasn't breached the surface of the ocean yet. It's called Loihi. And in 10,000 years ago, or 10,000 years or so, it's going to become the next Hawaiian island. And at some point, the big island of Hawaii is gonna get pulled off the hot spot and not be active anymore. What if there wasn't plate tectonics? What if the plate didn't move? What would a volcano look like out in the middle of the ocean if the plate never moved? Would you have a chain of islands, first of all? No, what would you get? You just get one ginormous volcano, right? That leads us back to Mars. Remember, Mars has these ridiculously big volcanoes? but there's no chains of volcanoes on Mars. So what we think is going on on Mars is there's no plate tectonics. If you have a hot spot, it just burns and burns and burns and burns and burns. So you can do an experiment later if you want. Take a lighter, put your hand over the lighter, let it burn a little blister, and then slowly move it for about five minutes. Flop it over and you're gonna have a nice chain of blisters across your hand, right? Then switch hands, if you can do it, and put your hand over and just let it sit there for five minutes. Don't move it. Flip it over, what do you have? A ginormous blister and a lawsuit against your stupid professor that told you to do this, right? So if you allow it to stay in the same place, it's just gonna burn a huge volcano into this plate. So again, they can provide us with information, not only about what's going on here on Earth, but other planets as well. Okay. I think I have a diagram that sort of shows it. I don't know if I need to do this. Yeah, this just sort of shows it burning and then pulling off the plate. And if it wasn't being pulled off the plate, you would just pretty much add up the volume of all those volcanoes that were burned and that would give you the volume of one volcano that wasn't on a plate that was moving. All right, you guys have any questions? Okay, I'm going to stop there. Next part's going to take a little longer. No formal class on Tuesday. I'll assign a video and send you guys the link, and then we have class again a week from today. Sound good? All right, see you all in a week, hopefully.